Yeah, welcome to today's Young Generation service. I'm Elsie Obobisa Daku. Our preacher for today's service will be Kwame Asafoeje, Sunday school teacher, Ernest Asari. And the theme for today's session is forgive. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for our lives. We thank you that we've been able to meet as a family and as a fellowship to hear your word and to worship. We ask that you come into our midst in our bedrooms, in our living rooms, wherever we are, and you speak to us and you touch our hearts. In Jesus' name, have we prayed with so much thanksgiving. Amen. The opening hymn is MHB 342. Worship will be by one accord.
the Lord's Prayer. We shall now have some time with the Sunday school. Today we will learn about forgiving one another. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for these lovely children listening to us today. We pray that you continue to bless them and be in their lives to guide and teach them to do the right things. We thank you for their parents and we pray that you continue to provide for them so that they can take care of these little ones. We thank you for your protection, and we pray that as we are about to learn your word, you open up our minds and our hearts to listen attentively and to receive your teachings. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and personal Savior. Amen. Sometimes people do things to us that we do not like. For example, Someone takes our favorite toy without asking. Or our brother destroys something we cherish very well. Or someone says something that is very mean that hurts you. Can we think of times when people have done things to us we did not like? And also, what do we do when people do bad things to us? Some of us will want to do the exact same thing to the person who wronged us. If you push me, I'll push you. If you pinch me, I'll pinch you. Some of us will also decide not to talk to the person anymore. 
and some of us will stop, be, uh, will stop being friends with that person. And others will also try to get that person into trouble every time. And if they do the slight, they, they make the slightest mistake, we are very quick to go to our teachers and our parents to report them. How many of us can honestly say that we will let it go and forgive whoever has wronged us? And how many times will we be willing to forgive someone when he does something bad to us repeatedly? Jesus was once asked how many times we should forgive our brothers and sisters. And his answer was 77 times. I know it would be very difficult to track how many times someone has wronged you and you've forgiven the person. You know, if today someone steps on your, your foot, you've marked one. Someone pushes you, you've marked one, I've forgiven him. It would be very difficult to keep track up to 77 times. So what I think Jesus is trying to tell us is that any time we are wronged, we should try our best to forgive whoever has wronged us. There are so many passages in the Bible that talk about forgiving one another. If you look at the story of Joseph, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was accused of doing things he did not do and thrown into jail. However, when he had the chance to take revenge on his brothers, he rather forgave them. Jesus once told a parable to his disciples about forgiveness. And this is how it goes. There was once a king who woke up one day and decided to go into the town and look for everyone who owed him money because a lot of people had borrowed money from him and had not paid back. So he decided to go out and collect his money. On his way, he met one servant of his who he remembered owed him a lot of money. So he called him, hey, come here. I know you owe me some money, a lot of it, and you have not paid back. I want you to pay back today, right now. If you don't pay back, I'll throw you into jail. The servant knew that he did not have money to pay back at that very instance. So he went on his knees and started pleading with the king, king, king. I beg you, I do not have your money right now, but give me a little time and I'll pay you back all that I owe you. He continued to plead with the king and the king had pity on him and decided to forgive him of all the debt that he owed him and asked him to go away. So on his way, this servant was very happy. I'm sure you can imagine how happy he was that the king had forgiven him all his debt that he owed him. On his way, he met a friend, another colleague of his, who owed him a little bit of money. And this servant, having been just forgiven by the king, had forgotten what had happened. Saw his friend who owed him a little money and called him. Hey, you come here. You owe me some money. I want you to pay me my money right now. His friend looked at him and said, pleaded with him and said, please, my friend, I don't have your money right now. Give me a little time and I'll be able to pay you back all that I owe you. This servant was not forgiven and asked his friend to pay him back all the money he owed and told him, if you don't pay back today, I will call the guards to send you to jail. His friend continued to plead with him, but he would have none of it and asked the guards to send his friend to jail. The other people in the town saw what had happened and quickly rushed to the king and reported what, had, what they had seen. They asked him, king, wasn't it that servant of yours that you just forgave all that he owed you? The king said, yes, I did that this morning. Well, a friend of his owes him money and he has thrown his friend in jail. The king was furious and summoned the servant before him and asked him, weren't you the same person that I forgave his debts 
a few hours ago, the servant was very grateful and said, oh yes, I remember. It was a very kind gesture of you, my king. Then the king asked him, so why couldn't you forgive your friend that owed you very little money? Because of what you've done. You wicked servant, I will throw you in jail until you pay me back all my money. The servant was then thrown in jail. Some of us are like the servant who could not forgive his friend, even though he had been forgiven for owing so much. But we've also learned from the story that if you are not able to forgive someone, you also not be forgiven. Jesus is trying to teach us to forgive one another. And I know this is very difficult for us to do. For all of us children, even some of your parents find it difficult to forgive. But Jesus is asking us to try. So, I will just ask that if there's anyone who has wronged you, it could be today, you could contact the person, call the person, or sit with the person, let the person know what they have done wrong, and let them know that you've let it go and you've forgiven them. If it were not for the fact that we're in this COVID time, I would have said that you could hug them or shake their hands. But because of social distancing, we are not allowed to do that. In any case, you can still call them and talk to them about this. I hope we've learned a lot from this lesson. And we've, um, we've learned a lot from this lesson, and we're going to put it to practice. And if anyone wrongs us, we'll do our best to forgive them. Before we go, I would want us to learn a memory verse. And this memory verse is from Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. And I read, Be tolerant with one another and forgive one another whenever any of you has a complaint against someone else. You must forgive one another just as the Lord has forgiven you. I know this verse may seem a little long, so I would suggest that we only learn the last part of the verse. Colossians 3:13b. You must forgive one another just as the Lord has forgiven you. Colossians 3:13b. Amen. The parable we learned today also can be found in Matthew chapter 18, verse 25 to 35. If you have time, you can read this later. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you've taught us today. We pray that you touch our hearts so that we'll be able to forgive our friends or anyone who has done anything that we do not like. We pray for your continuous protection and blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first scripture reading will be taken from Genesis 50, verses 15 to 21. Genesis 50, verses 15 to 21. It reads, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph, saying, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now, please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Here ends the scripture reading. Our second scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 14, verses 1 to 12. Accept the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything but not treats with contempt the one who does not. 
And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. One person considers one day more sacred than another, and another considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives for ourselves alone, and none of us dies for ourselves alone. If we live, we live for the Lord, and if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Or why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then, each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Here ends the scripture reading. Our gospel reading will be taken from Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Matthew 18, 21 to 35. The parable of the unforgiven debtor. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who, was, who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debts. But the man fell down before his master and begged. Please, be patient with me, and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him, and released him and forgave his debts. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servants fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will pay, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servants, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servants just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he was paid until he paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your hearts. The word of the Lord. The hymn before the sermon is MHB 669. Dear Lord and Father of Mankind.
praise the Lord. Shall we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We bless you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. We say that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the start and the finish. You are our very good God, the God that gives us life. You are the God that gives us all that we need. You know our needs and you take care of us. We worship you. We adore you. We pray that this morning you will dispense life to all of us, that your word will bring healing, life, and deliverance to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our theme this morning is forgive. It is one of those things that... Um, it's easy to tell somebody to forgive, but you, you find it difficult yourself if you end your shoes. Amen. To forgive is not an easy thing because of the pain and hurt it comes along with. You can hear the whole world say that, you know, let go, you know, uh, forgive and forget. It's not that easy. You hear people say that holding on to unforgiveness makes you um, toxic, it, it, it destroys your life, it's like an acid in a vessel, you know, so let go but unfortunately it's not that easy for us to just let go, especially when there is pain, especially when it, it, you are hurt okay, and forgiveness is especially extremely difficult when you have been betrayed by a loved one or people you trust it could be a parent, it could be a friend, it could be a lover. A friend that you regarded as your confidant and shared all your intimate secrets with, but then he betrays you. A family that you thought you know would stand by you and provide for you, but they abandon you and cast you out like, like Joseph. It could even be your own God when you're expecting a certain thing from him, when you have prayed for something. That for perhaps, you know, he keeps your, your, your loved one from dying and the person passes away. You can hold on, on to bitterness, you know, even toward your God. And it could also be yourself. When things that you've done in your past haunts you, it chases after. Any time you remember some of the things you have done, your heart, your heart just, you, you, you jump because of the things that you've remembered and there's so much pain. Amen. It is the pain and the hurt that makes forgiveness difficult. It is made worse by friends who don't know how, what you are going through or you know how you feel and, yet, and they trivialize your pain like how the, the friends of, uh, of Job did to him. Amen. So forgiveness is not an easy thing. People can tell you to forgive, but then it's not that simple. On the outside, it looks, you may look okay, you may pretend that you are fine, but on the inside, you, have the, uh, you, you haven't forgiven the person, and the pain is still there. This morning, we want to find out how or explore some of the ways that God has, has given to us in order to help us forgive. Amen. Like everything regarding our new birth, it starts and ends with trusting our Lord Jesus. In our Matthew scripture, Matthew 18, 21 to 35, Peter was trying to find an easy way out and also trying to impress Jesus by advocating that when your brother does something against you, you can forgive him seven times and, and that would end. But then Jesus was very quick, very fast to rebut him knowing the implications of just saying that, oh, you can just forgive seven times and it was over. Jesus made sure that he understood the import of it by telling him that it takes seven times, 70 times before you can say that, oh, you are no longer uh, going to forgive this person. 490 times if you are, if you are multiplying. And it just shows you how, how, how there is no limit as to how many times somebody can hurt you and ask for forgiveness from you. In that same scripture, Jesus went on to tell the, about the parable of the servant who couldn't forgive his fellow servant, even though he had been forgiven by his, his own master. 
okay? The, the point of that parable was the fact that one cannot look to Christ and what he has done and continue in unforgiveness. In its simplest form, we need to look at the Father and what he has done, and it will be easier for us to forgive. Just like the Lord's prayer says that, you know, um, we forgive others as you have forgiven us. Amen. So the point is to look at God, is to focus on Jesus Christ and, then, and, 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 and understand your own self before forgiveness can come. Amen. If we deeply consider and meditate what God has done for us, it puts us on the path of forgiveness. We forgive because he has forgiven us. The thing that makes forgiveness difficult is the pain and the hurt we feel. The reason we cannot forgive is that we have lost something, be it our home, our friendship, our love, our peace, our reputation, our job, etc., or even hope. And we don't know how we are going to be restored or recover what we have lost. But that's where our Lord comes in. The Bible says that, you know, in 1 Peter 5, verse 7, the Lord asks us to bring our care, our anxiety, our pain, and our hurt to him. To truly be free from pain and hurt, we have to look to Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our race. What he has done for us, what he's still doing, and what he will do for us. You see, we see the love and mercy of Jesus Christ in many instances in the Bible. We see how he was very intimate and shared the burden of the people who were going through serious pain and hurt. For one of the many instances, one of the instances that I know that we are very familiar with is the woman with the issue of blood. And you should understand this woman. This was a woman that for 12 good years, you know, had, had, had a problem, had a condition. And in those days, you couldn't come out if you were having such an issue. Bible says that he had spent his living, he had spent his living on physicians. He had gone to them several times and he was in pain. And for such a person, you weren't allowed to be in the public. You weren't allowed to be amongst people. Okay, so it took a lot for, for this woman to go out and touch the hem of Jesus' garment. But what is, what is significant is the fact that Jesus could have just let it go, that, oh, power has come out of me. Jesus didn't make sure that, he, he made a point to the people around. He made sure that that person was called, he called the woman to, him, uh, to himself, and then did what? He called her, my daughter, be comforted. The point of this was that, even though the, she had been healed physically, Jesus wanted to just make the point that I, have, I know your pain. You've gone through a lot, but do not worry. Be comforted. Go and be fully healed. Amen. This was a, a, a point that Jesus did that. He could have let the woman go, but he wanted to prove a point that he wants to deal with us one-on-one, -on -one, intimately, not through the crowd, not through the hustle and bustle, but intimately. Amen. Another example is the leper. The leper also was going through pain. Because he was a leper, he was shunned by his community for, for years and did, not know, and did not know whether Jesus was willing to save him and care for him. Jesus again came out openly and touched him. And you should understand the impact of this touch because for a leper, when you are approaching anybody, you were, you were shouting, you know, don't come near me, don't come near me, don't come near me. And the leper had had this in his mind. So when he was approaching, he thought, that, no, you know, I have to be sure whether Jesus will heal me. And Jesus made the point of touching this person for him to know that, look, you are loved. You are loved by God. You are loved by the Father. I care about you. And Jesus said, yes, I am willing. You see, we have a God that is not only able to save us, but is also willing to save us, is willing to deliver us. Amen. So our God is a personal God. He, he knows our problem. He won't stand afar and, and give you a miracle. He wants you to come close. He wants you to approach him. And then he gives you that touch. That touch that, that this leper has sought for years. Because for many years, I'm sure this leper had nobody touch him. Because when he was approaching Everybody would run away. Everybody would move away because he was an untouchable. But Jesus touched him 
and prove the point that, yes, you are beloved of the Father. Amen. And we talk about the woman who was red-handed. He was caught red-handed in adultery. He was picked up, I'm sure, straight from the bed and stuff like that. And, you know, what was going through this woman's mind? You know, she had just be, she was being humiliated. She was being embarrassed, and she feared for her life, you know. Such a person was coming with all kinds of things going through the mind, fearful that the authorities, fearful that, you know, the powers that be were going to destroy her. And the only thing that Jesus told her was that, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Showing us once again that, look, Jesus came for the grieving. Jesus came for the hurting. Those that are in pain, those who are hurting, those who are finding it difficult to forgive someone or somebody. Because the woman, I would ask, where was the guy who he was engaged in adultery with? He had been let go. But yet Jesus said, that, look, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Amen. He is not the only one. There are more people. Another person is Zacchaeus. Uh, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was, was um, a tax collector. He was reviled by the people of those days. Nobody, more or less, they didn't like him. You know, he was shunned also by his community. He was, nobody liked him. And he was also short, you know. And, uh, and he wasn't beloved. In simplicity, he wasn't beloved. But the Bible says that, you know, Jesus came. And then he, he saw him and he called him Zacchaeus. He called him. This guy was struggling, you know, to find Jesus and thought that he wasn't a person that he could come close to Jesus. But Jesus called him out and said, that today I'm coming to your house. Somebody that the community uh, um, um, shunned, somebody that was not beloved in the community, who was, I'm sure because of his work, he was reviled. Because of what he had to do for a living, he was not like, yes, he may have been corrupt in one way or the other. But that was a person that Jesus said, today I'm coming to your house. I would have supper in your house. Sounding out to the whole world that, look, I am interested in you. I am interested in the people that are shunned by the world. I'm interested in people, in the people that in, perhaps these days, the politicians that we know to be corrupt. And we think that, you know, they deserve a bigger place in hell. Jesus made sure that, look, I, 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 I am interested in you. I care about you too. So whatever pain Zacchaeus had until then, I believe that it was beginning to ease up. Whatever hatred he had had for his community, for shunning him, it was going away. Amen. And then there's the man at the pool of Siloam. He, for, for 38 years, was disabled. And he had been looking for a miracle for 38 years. He always lay by the pool hoping that one day, when the stirring of the pool comes, he will be able to slip in, or somebody would, would be merciful to him and push him in. This person, after 38, had virtually lost hope. When Jesus walked through the crowd and went to him and asked him that, do you want to be made whole? He himself was confused. He started talking about his history. You know, he, he, he had lost hope. He didn't think that he could be, could be saved anymore. But Jesus asked him, do you want to be whole? And he said, yes. And Jesus healed him after 38 years. Now, why would Jesus go through all the crowd, um, ignoring other people and single out this person? I believe because he wanted to restore this man's hope in the living God. For many years, he had waited for that miracle. That miracle, that, that angel staring the water, it hadn't happened. Jesus went to him in order to prove that you are not forgotten. You are not lost. I still care about you. Even though you didn't know I was coming, even though you weren't looking for me, I have come to you to tell you that you can be made whole. Amen. Another person um, that is of significance about the love of Jesus Christ in, in attending to our, our pain and our hurt. Jesus had, had gone to minister somewhere and and. Evening had come. You would have thought that Jesus would relax. But after he had done everything, he told his disciples, let us go to the other side. And the other side involved taking a boat to a boat on, this, uh, on, on the way. I think there was even a storm on the waters. But Jesus braved all that and went to the other side. 
On the other side, there was this person. Bible says that he, he was, he was demon-possessed. Demons had filled him. And the demons were so many that he, they called themselves legion, meaning that there were several of them. And this person at first ran to Jesus and bowed down. And then the demons took over. Bible says that he dwelt in tombs. He dwelt in, 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 in the wilderness, more or less. And that often he would be bound because of what he could do. But Jesus found him. And what is significant is the fact that Jesus, he, he was the only person there that Jesus ministered to. When Jesus said, let us go to the other side, he was going for one single person, just one person, okay? And Jesus did not care whether it was evening, whether it was late, or whether he had to cross a boat. He said that, no, I have to go and deliver this person. I have to go and save this person. And this person was so, was so happy. He wanted to follow Jesus. But Jesus said that, no, you stay here and, and do my bidding. So Jesus, after ministering to one group of people, remembered a single person, a single person who, had, who was an outcast. Nobody wanted a demon-possessed person as a friend. They had even chained him, and he only lived in tombs. But Jesus made time to go to this person. Jesus made time to go minister deliverance to this person. Amen. Jesus is for everyone, everyone that is grieving, everyone that is hurting. Finally, the woman at the well, another interesting pe uh, person. For her, she was also an outcast. She was a Samaritan. She was more or less, she was of a different race. She was a woman. And she was also hurting. Jesus made sure that he went to meet her at the time that she would come out. Because for her, she couldn't go out. She didn't, couldn't go out because she was afraid of ridicule. She was afraid of embarrassment. She was afraid of humiliation. Jesus made a conscious attempt to change his path in order to meet her. Okay? An outcast, an alien, an adulterer, a woman, a sinner, and offer her living water. After she, uh, Jesus had ministered to, to her, they brought him food and said, look, I, I'm not even interested in food anymore because of the life that had been given to this woman. And you see, Jesus altered. The, the, the thing that matters is that even though Jesus was going somewhere, but made time. Jesus made time. He made time. Let us not think that God doesn't have time for us, that God is too, too far away to minister to us personally. It does, you don't need a church. You don't need, you don't need too many people. You just need Jesus. When the pain is there, when the hurt is there, he will make his way to you. He will alter his path. He will move nations. The Bible says, I give uh, Seba, I give Egypt. I give them all for you. I give them in exchange. I give men in exchange for you. He will alter his path just to meet you. Amen. There are many more examples of how Jesus has sought out the downtrodden, the abused, the castaway, the vile, the cowardly, the fearful, the sick, the despised, the crazy, the mentally deranged. All these people have been living in pain and hurting for years. Jesus made sure that they were made whole physically, emotionally, and mentally. In Luke 4.18, and Jesus paraphrasing Isaiah 61, Jesus launched his manifesto, declaring that he had come to preach good news to the poor, heal the brokenhearted, deliverance to the captives, give sight to the blind, proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and comfort them that mourn. Tell me which of these people are not, are not hurting. Tell me which of these people are not bleeding inside to the poor, and tell me this, whether these people do not have a grudge against the world, do not have a grudge against someone, someone who may have caused their pain, that did something to them that they will lose their money, their wealth, their finances. They, had, they were grieving. They were hurting. Yet Jesus says that that is who he came to seek for. 
They are the people that he looks for. For those who are in pain, broken, lost, destitute, grieving, hurting, shunned by the world. These are the people that Jesus loves. If you are one of these people, you need to look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. He is our high priest who has gone through whatever we are going through and is able and willing to help us out. So whatever you are holding on to, sometimes we feel we are entitled to our pain. We are entitled to our hurt. We have a right to revenge. We have a right to seek vengeance. And the good thing is that God has made it expressively clear that vengeance is for him. He will repay. It's not for you. You ought to let go. He would, he would deal with whatever situation, whatever problem. It's for him to act. And he doesn't speak as if he doesn't know it. The Bible says that he's a high priest who has gone through whatever we are going through. And he's able, not just able, he's willing to help us face the same problems, face the same situations. He's the one we ought to look up to. Not focus on the person who has grieved you or hurt you. It's Jesus Christ that you are fixing your eyes on. He's the one that was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The Bible says that he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So why do you want to carry, continue carrying your own sorrows? Why do you want to continue carrying your own griefs? You are burdening yourself. He says, come to me. The Bible says, it's, this is even in the past. The Bible says he has borne it. He's already carrying it. You have to learn to let go. You have to be able to release it. Bible says he was smitten by God. He was afflicted, wounded for our transgressions, and bruised for our, our iniquities. Bible says that the chastisement for our peace was upon him. If you are looking for peace and, and you feel that you need that peace, Bible says that whatever you need to go through that peace, he has taken it upon himself. He's done it. Bible says the chastisement was upon him. For the chastisement for our peace was upon him. Amen. Indeed, the Bible says that of his fullness have we received grace for grace, blessing for blessing, favor for favor. Amen. And I get excited every time I read this verse. The Bible says of his fullness have we received grace for grace. It's not a bad for good or nothing like that. He says that grace for grace. That means that you have grace. What are you exchanging that grace for? For more grace. What are you exchanging the blessing that you have? What are you exchanging it for? More blessing. So the Bible says, of his fullness, of his fullness, of, the, of his fullness, if you have, if, of his fullness, we have the grace of God. Amen. He is the person we are considering when we can't forgive. He is the person that we are hoping, we are hope, where, where we are putting our hoping when there's too much pain for us to let go. Bible says that he's the restorer of broken walls. What, you have, what have you lost through that pain? What have you, whatever you've gone through that you are grieving, what, what have you lost? As I said earlier, you may have lost money. You may have lost your riches. Bible says he's the restorer of broken walls, a renewer of ruined cities. Amen. Bible says he gives us beauty for ashes. Bible says the oil of joy for mourning. A garment of praise instead of despair. And he makes us oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. One of the reasons why we struggle is that we do not know how we are going to gain back what we have lost. Perhaps, you know, your, your, your beloved was snatched away by some person and you, th you think that that's the only person you could ever love or could ever be for you. you. You have lost a friend and um, you do not know how that void can be filled. Bible says that he's a restorer of broken walls. And this is where the example of Joseph comes in. Joseph lost everything, literally everything. He lost his mother after his brother was born. He lost his father because he was taken away. He lost his brothers. He lost his family. He lost his community. Bible says he was sold into slavery. 
not just that, was wrongly accused, was put into prison, was demoted, and was slandered, was forgotten, and left to rot away. Tell me, which of these things don't you see yourself uh, falling in? Joseph went through everything. All these things, Joseph endured it. But the Bible says that the restorer of broken walls did not leave him. Slowly, when he wasn't even aware, God was restoring him and changing his destiny. You know, he, he previously made numerous attempts to restore himself. He would tell people that, when you get there, remember me. When you get there, remember me. And God made sure that they all forgot. So that when it, the appointed time came, Joseph would see the, the height from which God was going to lift him up. Amen. Joseph was restored, not just physically, but God, God gave him a new community. God gave him a new family. God gave him a new position. Not just that, God began to restore his father to him. His father returned to him. His brothers also returned to him. And, and, family, and his family, all of them was returned to him. And Joseph trusted in God. It's obvious to us that, you know, whilst he was in, in prison, he did not lose his faith. He, he still had faith in God. He didn't know how God was going to do it, but he believed God. And the Bible says that God restored it over and above what he had, uh, uh, he had imagined. So much that his own brothers came and bowed before him. Remember, he, had, he also lost his dream. He thought he had lost his dream, but God was faithful. The dream was, was recovered. The dream was manifested. Amen. Because of Joseph's relationship with God, he was able to recognize the hand of God amidst the despair, the confusion, the disorder, the chaos, the pain, the trauma, and the hurt. By looking to the invisible, the only wise God, he found light at the end of the tunnel. When you meditate on Jesus, his person, what he has done, what he's doing in your life, and what he would do you will naturally begin to let go. When you are focusing on Jesus Christ, when you are, your eyes is fixed on him, you lose sight of those who have hurt you, of the things that have hurt you. And by looking to Jesus, you are, it's easier to begin to forgive. By beholding the king intently, we find our place. Your focus will no longer be on those who hurt you, but on, but on the table he has prepared for you. Amen. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus and forget the rest and forget how somebody has hurt us. Let us not be, be bound by the pain. The pain, Jesus says that he's taking it away. Jesus says that he's doing away with it. Jesus is the restorer of broken walls. He is the one that takes care of us. I want to tell you that this is not, this is not difficult. Bible has called us not to try, but to trust him. We are called not to, to try and, and forgive, but to trust God. By beholding Jesus Christ, by seeing what he has done, and the examples of other people who have been through pain, who have been through hurt, we fix our eyes on Jesus. When there is pain, when there is pain and hurt, the person has hurt you, has hurt you so badly, you don't know what to do, turn to Jesus. He won't, he won't cast you out. He's more than able to do it. You only have to believe. You only have to trust. You only have to hold firmly onto the one you have trusted. He's more than able. Bible says he gives nations in exchange for one person. You would have thought that the world is too big for God to, uh, uh, to find you. But God will find you, just like the man at the pool. God will look for you. He will find you. He knows what you are going through, especially when there's no one to help. God will find you and heal you. 
God is waiting for you to come to him. God is waiting for you to present the problems to him. God is waiting to present you, for you to present your issues to. What have you lost? What have you lost that you think cannot be gained? You can gain everything back. You can gain everything back. You only have to hope in, me, uh, in God and not in men. Trusting in God is, is, is the ultimate. It's not that, and he's not, some say that he's slow, but he's not. God is always timely. God is always timely. He will never let it, you go like that. He will make sure that he meets you at the point of your need. Bible says in his time, he makes all things beautiful. And you have to, he's, he's painting a beautiful picture. You have to learn to trust him. You have to learn. And it's interesting, the scripture we've been using from Hebrews 12, Bible says the author and perfecter of our race. And the, the, the interesting thing is that he's the author, meaning that he's the one that is writing the story. And for every good book that has an underdog, the more the person is deemed an underdog, when the person is lifted up, it's, it's just beautiful. It's just lovely. Amen. So God is able, able to heal you. And I want to add from what the leper said. God is not just able. He's willing. He's willing to be, take, up, take up your burden. He's willing to carry that cross for you. He's willing to ease your pain. In fact, he's already done it. Bible says he has borne it already. He's taking it all upon himself. So why are you still holding on to that bitterness? So why are you holding on to that pain? It's not yours. Give it to God. Vengeance is, is for him. He will repay. When God is punishing, he knows how to punish. You cannot punish him now. And why do you even want him to punish? Amen. The Bible says that love does not keep a record of wrongs. How many times can you keep a tab? 490 times. It's impossible. It's insane. Look to Christ. It makes it easier to let go. Look to Jesus and you'll be freed from your burden. Look to Jesus and you'll be delivered. Look to Jesus. The Bible says that you are the person that Jesus came for. Your pain is why he came. Your hurting is why he came. He came for nothing else. He didn't come for the righteous. And that's what another point that he made clear when people said that he was a sinner because he had been to Zacchaeus' house. He said, I, did not come, I came to seek and to save that was lost. Emphasis on seek. He's looking for you. Why do you think God is far away? God is close to you. God is waiting to reach you. God is waiting for you to take a, your time and just look his way. Just come to him. And he asks you, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be released from pain? He's more than willing. Come and be made whole. Come and be made whole. Bible says his burden is light. His yoke is light. His burden is light. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we want to thank you. We want to bless your name. We want to give you glory. We want to give you praise. Father, we present ourselves to you. I pray that everyone that is grieving, everyone that is hurting, and there are many, we pray that we will receive your love. We pray that we will receive your mercy. We pray that we will receive your goodness. Your way says that of your fullness have we received grace for grace. We pray for an abundance of grace. For where our eyes are dim because we see nothing but the pain, we pray that you will let go. You will help us to let go of our pain. Let us fix our eyes on you and not on the things that, are, that grieve us or the people that hurt us or the people that are, are, are abusive to us. We pray that you yourself will be closer to us than the people around us. We pray that you will be closer, closer, reach us. Let us know of your ever present, that you are ever present with us, Lord. I pray that you will bring healing and deliverance to all of us, just for like all the people that we've talked about. Bring healing to us. Let us be healed. Release your love and your mercy to all of us. Jesus, we thank you. Jesus, we bless you. We give you glory. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let us enter into a time of intercession. Let's pray for our nation, Ghana. Let's pray for the leaders of this nation, that God will be with them as they make and take decisions for the nation, that he will guide them and he will speak to them and that his will will be done in our nation. Let's pray for peace for our nation, even in these elections, even during this pandemic. Let's pray that he will protect the members, the citizens of this nation. Shall we continue to pray for the church, the church universal? Also, let's pray for Accra Ridge Church in particular, our church. Let's pray that his peace will reign in our church, that he will bind us with his courts of love. Let's pray for the individuals of this church. If anyone has lost a loved one, if anyone is ill, let's pray that God will be their source of comfort. God will, be, will touch them with his healing hand. If anyone lacks, let's, let's pray for financial provision for them. As we pray for individuals as well, let's pray for ourselves. We know what we are going through. We know what we seek from God. Let's commit it into his hands. He says we should commit our ways and he'll guide us. So let's ask for guidance too. Let's ask that he orders our steps. All right. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for our lives. We thank you for the word. We thank you for whatever you taught us on forgiveness. And we ask that you help us apply it in our daily lives. You help us act just as you would. You help us be your representatives on this earth. We ask that you be with us throughout the week. As we go in and out, you grant us traveling mercies. So that next week we shall meet again, even if it's online. We shall meet again to continue to praise and glorify you. In Jesus' name have we prayed with so much thanksgiving. Amen. We will now take our welcome message. Welcome to the Accra Red Church. We aspire to be a strong united church, impacting families. Come, let us enter in. Communities. Workplaces. Say that again. Sing with me. This is the hour. And nations for Christ. Hear the Spirit calling. Offetry will be led by one accord.
We are still in the career month. Remember to join us on Wednesdays for an VOC at 6 p.m. And on Saturdays, there will be a question and answer session on Zoom. That's at 6.30. Also, please remember to book your seats on the link. It will be in the description below for Sunday service next week. The closing hymn is MHB 347. Come, O thou, O victorious Lord. Benediction. The Lord whom you love and trust, may he cause you not to fear by day or by night, by morn or by noon. May he lift you up, may he walk with you, may he lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace 
both now and always. Amen. The recessional song will be by one accord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Yeah, 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 yeah.